Welcome back, ladies and lads, to another episode of The Political Scribe, the podcast where AP Gov students analyze politics and write down their thoughts. I'm your host, Christian Keller, and today I have two wonderful questions for a wonderful cast. We have Maya, Livia, Shifa, Catherine, Joshua, Siddharth, Joseph, and Isabella. You know how we do this. When someone speaks, they will either have a green or red background. Green is for pro, red is for no. Our first question comes from longtime viewer Joseph Laskowski. He asks, should the Electoral College be changed or not? Yes, the Electoral College should be changed. The Electoral College is not an accurate representation of the people in America. For example, in the 2016 election, Hillary Clinton won the popular vote, but Donald Trump won the electoral vote. The popular vote is the direct votes of the people, which is what should mainly be considered in the election, as America is supposedly a strong democracy. There are 38 out of 50 states who almost always vote for the same party each year, no matter the candidate. The 12 swing states are the states that really determine the election. It does not matter how many people vote in any of the states, because each state only has a certain number of electoral votes, so no, not every vote matters. It is not a direct democracy. The election should not be based on the representatives of the states, but the people. Yes, the decision of the election will take longer, but the chosen president will be a direct result of the people. While I understand your point of view, looking at the sheer size of the United States, we can effectively select our next national leader based off of over 150 million registered voters. Moreover, when you think about the numerous factors skewing the results of the ballot, voting based off of popular vote or majority is merely not plausible. Plus, there are so many uneducated voters who are not looking at the candidates themselves, nor their plan for the country, and instead vote based on party identification, which causes split partisanship. Additionally, some people don't care about voting, aka voter apathy. To add to that, political bandwagoning is prevalent today, and by looking at the demographics of voter turnout or whoever actually cast their ballot, Popular vote is not the best option. These fallacies can be avoided with the Electoral College, however. By using the system of appointing electors to represent states, it allows for the perfect compromise. It prevents a common issue we see with popular vote, mob voting. By allotting a different number of electoral votes to states based on their population and the number of congressional districts, each state is represented fairly. And yes, before you say anything, every vote still counts. It is disproportionate and gives undue power as it clearly defeats the basic principle of one man, one vote, thus suppressing a common man's choice. If there's so much emphasis on the opposite side about the electoral college protecting the rights of minorities, this is absolutely incorrect. It is a fact that it is the job of the courts to protect the rights of the people, and it is the president's job to further represent them. It polarizes our electorate into red and blue, signifying that there is no room for the aspiring parties. The most prominent reason is the original establishment reason of the Electoral College is no more applicable. Originally, it was created for the simple fact that whoever received the majority of votes would become president and the runner-up would be vice president. Clearly, this is not the case today. It is vital to eradicate a political method that is no more relevant to the cause of the nation. Thank you for your input. However, I believe the Electoral College should not be changed. According to Alexander Hamilton, the Electoral College is put in place because it ensured that the office of president will never fall into the hands of a man who does not have the proper qualifications. Reading ourselves at the Electoral College would not automatically install a national popular vote for presidency. That would require a complex constitutional amendment specifying comprehensive details for conducting such a national vote and could even provoke calls for a completely rewriting of, of the Constitution. Simply changing a current procedure without making a new one in its place could trigger the largest political crisis in American history since the Civil War. Abolishing the Electoral College now might satisfy a yearning for direct democracy, but it could also mean dismantling federalism. Federalism is the bones of our nation, and abolishing the Electoral College could point towards doing away with the entire federal system. The Electoral College is probably the single most useless political system created in the past 300 years. To understand why the Electoral College system was created, you had to go back to when our Constitution was created. The Founding Fathers created the system because during that era, information could easily spread over the entire country. And the only way people would know why the can what the candidate stands for was if the candidate visited them locally. The other reason was because of slavery. The South, who outnumbered the North in population due to their number of slaves, had to be kept in check with the Three-Fifths Compromise, which stated that every five slaves was counted as three people. These two reasons are completely outdated when we look at today's America. Now, an average person could look on the internet and find out what a political candidate stands for in a few seconds. 
And needless to say, slavery has been abolished since the 1800s. So instead of candidates focusing on swing states or states with higher electoral votes, candidates should focus on America as a whole. Then maybe we wouldn't have one of the lowest voter turnout rates amongst industrial nations. So why will we still use a system that has no benefit to the voting people in America? Okay, nice. Those were some great perspectives. Let's move on to our next question, which is again by Mr. Laskowski. Should political parties and affiliation be banned or not? I'll start off answering this question. And I say they should. Just take a look at this past election. The nation is so divided. There seems to be this false dichotomy of being either a Republican or a Democrat. Voting a third party is essentially useless. James Madison wrote Federalist Paper Number 10 and stated that the large size of the country would make it more difficult for factions to gain control over others, but that could not be further from the truth. Today, Republicans and Democrats reign supreme over any other party, and because of the vast differences between those two parties' ideals, Americans that side with one are often bashed by the other. Sometimes people just want to be on the winning team and will do what they can to make the losing team, uh, losing team stay as losers. And that does not lead to negotiations and compromises that Madison believes will occur. And it definitely does not lead to decisions that respect the rights of minorities. President George Washington warned America in his farewell address about political parties. He advised Americans to simply coexist and act as a collective. As the saying goes in the Liberty Song, by uniting we stand, by dividing we fall. And that is exactly what political parties do. So yes, I believe that political parties and political affiliation should be banned. How about you, Siddharth? I don't think I can agree with Christian. There should be different political parties, because not everyone in that world agrees with each other. There should be a political party that can represent each person's ideology. The political party began to form during the struggle over ratification of the federal constitution of 1787, which proves that even back then, the whole country can agree on the same decision. You cannot have only one organization ruling forever. There will be a group of people leading that party then, and not everyone in the country will agree with them. Maybe not even the majority, and it will be very hard to bring them down since the officials have so much power. There should always be an opponent with the different views to criticize the ruling party. So the ruling party can try to make better rules that fit well for everyone. What do you think, Joseph? I completely disagree, Siddharth. I think political parties should be banned because they have been proven to divide and lead to conflict. If you look at the electoral maps of 1860 and 1864 when Lincoln ran, we can see that the South was mostly Democrat and the North was mostly Republican. This divide is mainly due to the party's deferring ideologies on slavery. The party's rhetoric and agenda further created division between the North and the South and led to the South creating their own state, the Confederate States of America. This led to the Civil War, which resulted in approximately 600,000 casualties and to this day remains the bloodiest war in U.S. history. So the First Amendment states that the people have the right to peacefully assemble. So banning political parties would be unconstitutional. And that's the only reason why I say we shouldn't ban them. But if it weren't unconstitutional, I would say we should ban them because I feel it would be beneficial towards America. Um, the Democrats and the Republicans have dominated for such a long time that voting has become a which side am I on type of ideology. Majority of people don't educate themselves on every candidate. So if political parties were banned, then it would force every voter to do their research on every candidate and consider them to be options, all of them as options. The title of Democrat and Republican is beneficial to get recognition, but the third party candidates don't get the same advantage. Overall, the elimination of political affiliation would not only give all candidates an equal opportunity to get recognized, but make people more open-minded and cause less division in the United States. There were a lot of great answers today, but that's all the time we have. I would love to hear your own thoughts down in the comments section below. I'll see you next time. This has been The Political Scribe. 